Okay, hello again, everyone. So welcome to the Imagining Queer Bandung event. And today we're very honored to have the Imagining Queer Bandung team from Berlin, in fact, from different parts of the world, talking about their fantastic experience of filmmaking, film exhibition and podcasting and so on. So I am going to hand over the mic to Kuo Pu Fan, who is one of the organizers and who is going to introduce all the other speakers and lead the panel discussion. Pu Pu, the uh, mic is yours. OK, thanks everybody for coming to this event and thanks Hongwei for inviting. And it's amazing that today's topic is called uh, Another Queer World is Possible. I don't know what is another uh, and we are all others in this society, I guess. Most of us living in a country that uh, we are supposedly not the majority. So it's uh, really amazing to have this great lineup. And uh, but uh, before everything start, um, I have to say that I had bad experiences teams <laughs> and uh, they really sucks. But uh, uh, thanks to British government, they uh, have to force us to use teams all the time. So if there is any technology problem comes and uh, don't blame us, blame on Microsoft. Um, so uh, briefly about me, myself, and uh, I'm a filmmaker from China, uh, now based in Berlin. And uh, a few years ago, oh, more than 10 years ago, actually, uh, together with my colleague in Beijing, we initiated uh, Korea University, which is um, a project that is uh, uh, training in the beginning, training young activists uh, and filmmakers, but later uh, extending into exchange between of, of uh, uh, filmmakers and uh, young activists. And in 2017, my colleague Xiao Gangwei uh, and uh, other uh, colleagues of mine brought also this program project to African countries. Um, and uh, uh, beside the film screening, also have a uh, uh, have workshop together. And so um, in in Berlin, and uh, last uh, actually, I know both of my co-curators, Sarnt and uh, and Regil, for uh, quite uh, a few years. And uh, last year uh, we met and discussed about the possibility to do uh, activities in the frame of queer Asia and uh, featuring about uh, both these two very important identity to all of us and uh, we uh, funded this program called Imagining Queer Bandung, not only on Asian queer identity, but, but more from a perspective questioning about identity and uh, extending about identity besides queer film uh, screenings. And we also uh, had this two a wonderful workshop and um, so um, I, I firstly want to um, once invite my colleague Sarnt to introduce about to give us a brief, brief background about uh, uh, the Berlin queer scene and uh, how uh, from their point uh, the, their perspective seeing uh, why it is necessary to have this event. So Sarnt. Um, hi, hello everyone. Um... Yeah, I'm, I'm very glad to be here and thanks everyone for joining. Um, I'm San Utama Short. I am also local filmmaker curator based in Berlin. And um, yeah, so I need to share my screen. Um, technology. Are you hearing, are you seeing me sharing? Yes, I can oh. see the slides now. Okay, perfect. Um, so it's, it's, it's almost like we are talking to ourselves, but okay, let it be. Um, yeah, hi everyone. So basically we operating in Berlin um, and just a few sort of facts as a background to remind you, um, Germany has um, kind of also very distinctive history as a, you know, sort of quote, unquote West European country. And maybe some of you remember that Germany used to have this um, anti-homosexual laws, paragraph 175 which was sort of like the huge thing that was a legacy, even you know before the Nazi time, and then the Nazi time that it became the law. And the law was deleted or destroyed in 90s. It was not, you know, be destroyed like kind of before. So actually it took a long time until Germany get to the point, even to recognize homosexuals as a, you know, legal bodies. But then it got complicated because of the split in, especially in Berlin into, you know, East and the West because of the Cold War policy, which also complicates a lot of things. Like, for example, that, I don't know, the space that we're operating in is called House That Statistic. 
which is also the leftover of the socialist GDR buildings. Um, so it means, you know, house of statistics. I guess back then people were making like statistics as a, you know, social policy, urban planning. And so in this building, um, it was not only that we are kind of appropriating this space to use some, to do some cultural thing, but it was actually kind of to re relieve this spirit of, you know, what East Berlin back then were trying to do, which kind of failed, is, you know, to achieve a certain kind of equality, quote unquote, in their own ideological term. But actually, it's, you know, even when we have film screenings or film workshop there, etc., it, it all reflects this spirit without knowing it because we are exactly working inside their own space. And of course, all these things are face gentrification. And so, you know, since the kind of this, um, the topic of equality came into question, then that it spins into this thing, what some people call rainbow capitalism, which some of you have known already. And it became a very really hard and difficult question to talk about, for example, queer colors, or talking about some certain struggle, for, like, for example, Palestinian struggles, or, you know, the intersection, or like even Romani struggles, because it seems like in the kind of a white queer spaces, these topics are not to be raised. And so I think it really became really important to create a space um, specifically for queer colors or, you know, other types of bodies that we can actually have this critical conversation together. But that sort of became like the background for this project. Um, the place where we work for is called Bibak, um, and it's um, sort of, they specialize in a post-migrant perspective. It was found by Marve Lipman and Jan Sun Gu, who worked for this space for a while. And usually they were somewhere else. And then now they found this cinema for Cinema Transtopia. I repeat again, because it's a very weird name for some people, Cinema Transtopia. And it was exactly in this house of statistic where I told you, they have brought so many interesting film programs um, throughout the years, like um, Decolonizing the Screen from the Charity, which you know, feature so many discussions, the Angeladen or like the invitees, which features the um, archive research on films on migration and migrants in Germany from the 70s with the Domit, if some of you have known it. And Fiction Bescheinigung is also a part of Berlinale Forum this year, where they show like amazing films as a kind of retrospective on German people of color cinema. And then this is also Southeast Asian focus film screening that I'm having soon, Common Code. And so a part of our program took place, yeah, in June and July, Imagining Queer Bandung, which Rakyu will give you some details about the whole curatorial background behind it. But I'm just saying that now, for now, logistics, we had a program in June and then we had a little bit tour in Hamburg and in Munich to this last month. So it has been great. Um, it's a kind of first time collaboration between we three, Rakil, Popo, and me. And I'm very happy that it happened. And in general, this, this program just have like film screening and film workshop and podcasting workshop, which I think Rakil will give you more information about that. But that's all for me so now. Okay, now we invite Regil to talk about uh, the background of uh, Imagine Queer and Do and uh, the team, how, uh, how does this team uh, was uh, working and uh, funded. Thank you, Papa. Thank you, Hongwei, for organizing this event. Hi, everyone. My name is Regil. Uh, I am one of the community organizing of uh, Queer Asia uh, Collective, which is a collective of queer academics, activists, and filmmakers in London and in Berlin. I am a master student at the University of Hamburg. Uh, also, I'm a curator, and I'm one of the curators of the Imagining Queer Bandung. Uh, I'm going to share my slide talking about the curation behind the Imagining Queer Bandung, the theme itself, and what does queer uh, Imagining Queer Bandung mean. Uh, but before I talk uh, more into that, I will play a video about uh, the Asia Africa conference that took place in Bandung in the 1955. So I'm going to share my screen. Yeah. This is the first intercontinental 
Conference of Colored Peoples, so-called Colored Peoples, in the history of mankind. Okay, so that's uh, the Africa Asia Conference that took place in Bandung, which is a city in the, in West Java, Indonesia. Uh, and now I'm going to present. Okay, this is kind of complicated. Switching um, tab. Um, okay, so who are we and what is Imagine in Green Bandung? Um, the idea of creating the work and this uh, festival came about like a year ago, and it took us almost like that much of time uh, to come up with a concept with this concept uh, of like organizing a film festival and also organizing two workshop, which were um, the filmmaking workshop and the podcasting workshop. Uh, Imagining Queer Bandung, the theme itself came from our conversation that we had between me, Sarn, and Popo of wanting to create like a, an alternative space of knowledge making and knowledge transfer. Also like how cinematography can be kind of like a form of like a activism as well and how like films also like a really crucial aspect of our work or at least for like Popo and also Sarn. So coming from that um, sort of like inspiration from the, the conference, we wanted to create a space where uh, the work of like people from the global south, specifically from, you know, like in my creation practice, I kind of employed this kind of approach of like uh, amplifying the voices of people from Southeast Asia, which, you know, it's often kind of like lost or kind of forget in a way. So we wanted to kind of like come together and like curate a festival where we showcase the work of people from the global south in, at, at our film festival. And during the film festival, we had like it run through like eight days and we had eight sold out uh, programs. We had 28 screenings. We had about 10 guest uh, speakers and three performances at the opening and then uh, for the closing. And also like one DJ set and overall, I think we also had like over 300 attendants and it was uh, to place at Cine Cinema Transopia, which uh, Sarn had explained to you earlier. Uh, and beside that, we also had a free filmmaking and podcasting workshop uh, for specifically for queer BIPOC people based in Berlin or like surrounding area. We wanted to create space where this kind of like opportunity is not often afforded by us. Um, so we had that sort of like, I had the word power, but like the power to kind of like present something, create something for our community and like creating this kind of uh, space for people to be together. Um, and also like to take something and to learn something from each other as well. So all the uh, workshop facilitators we're all queer BIPOC uh, cultural pra practitioner, filmmakers, and podcasters. Um, I will talk about the podcasting workshop in a bit, I think. Uh, so right now, we're going to continue talking about the filmmaking workshop, which was led by um, Sarn and also Kit, I think. Um, and I will pass the speaker to you. Yeah, so um, as Regio had uh, give you uh, more general uh, information about uh, the background of uh, film screenings and the workshop. And uh, so uh, CERN, who is a coordinator for our filmmaking workshop and uh, Kit is our uh, major mentor for the workshop. Could you please share the process of selecting um, participant and also how you do decide the program? So welcome. Yeah, sure. Um, I think like so we I think we had a whole call um for applications um back in May ish um and received like almost thirty applications and um but also we actually made it very clear that like you know the language of application is not the criteria. So basically, we actually encouraged people to to be frank, like write shit. Um, but you know because language use should not be the criteria for you know it should not 
kind of say that you are more educated than others. Of course not. So basically, we receive a lot of applications, and then we selected only six participants um, between me and Kit. Um, was very hard decision because I think everyone has a lot of potentials and. The criteria were rather like the possibility of making this short film within Berlin, within the budget, and also the potential of being able to work as a group and also to contribute some perspectives to others. So um, it was almost like a curating per se um, perspectives within this space. And so with this six participant film, we got like, um, you know, very diverse and very critical views. like. We got Dalit queer person, we got a um, black Asian person, we got like um, a person from um, in exile who were also giving um, their opinions and experience about the workshop at the end of this talk. And, and I think ultimately we learn so much from them as much as they learn from us. So basically there's no this hierarchy between like students or uh, teachers because we are actually on a similar equal level of, you know, living through the world. And just that we know a bit more about quote unquote professional background, and that's all we know. Um, and but also kind of fuck up the structure of film school a bit. You know? So when you go to film school, you have this kind of proper structure of what you have to learn to be able to be called filmmaker. And we just have like whatever fuck you. Um, let's just do it the way we want it. So it was a lot of technical teachings, but also a lot of gossips, and you know just let people be. And I love this way of let's say knowledge production because ultimately there's no bigger structure or institution that you know standardize what we have to do and maybe kid can also expand on that hello kid hello um should i start <laughs> okay open your hand okay um oh sorry um hold on i think okay can everybody see me and um, i'm going to share the screen right now um is a screen sharing. OK, great. Um, I actually like uh, what Sal talks about that, how we kind of want to try to, you know, fuck up the um, um, film making or like a film, film, um, film teaching, in, uh, film teaching system, um, because um, the, the workshop is basically about decentralizing uh, the power. So um, to introduce myself, um, hello everyone. I my name is Kit Hong, and um, thank you very much for having me in the panel. And I am a filmmaker. Actually, I come from this perfect, you know, film education background. I am a lecturer in the film product. Uh, I am a lecturer in the in, in film production from the Hong Kong Film Academy. Um, and then I'm also a PhD student from the um, from Goldsmith University. Um, so this is actually what you're seeing here. Actually, is a good photo taken um, in uh, Cinema Transtopia um, after the eight day of workshop. So um, I have been teaching this workshop um, um, in different places because of the invitation from Popo and Xiaogang um, as from Kuei University. Um, that workshop, the similar workshop was actually held before in Beijing, in Guangzhou in China, uh, Zimbabwe, uh, Ghana, and this time in Berlin. And um, in, my PhD, uh, in my PhD studies um, in London, I actually encounter a lot of very interesting literature that talks about uh, queer feelings and queer hauntings um, that is actually suppressed and um, but actually very valid for to, for us to discuss and very valid and uh, have the importance for us to foreground them to talk about them. So I decided to um, help the participant in the workshop to foreground their feeling to validate their personal experience in the queer world um, and providing them with very basic uh, techniques and knowledge in audiovisual language, so to help them to visualize their ideas. Those are little uh, literature that I reference to. Um, in the very first day, I first start to uh, distinguish the idea between knowing, experiencing, and practicing. Everybody, when when everybody hears something, they start to know something, but it's actually very different from how they experience that things. And when they continue and repeatedly practicing something, the experience actually evolve and change their 
they're happy as well. And this is how I want to start the course. Um, first, actually, I try to create a very safe space uh, for them to share their personal experience. Um, I uh, use the singing bowl as an example. While we know the singing bowl can make sounds, I actually ask each of them to hit the singing bowl by themselves, to place them in different body parts, and to experience different type of sound quality, and also uh, to experience how the the sound intensity and sound vibration is created. Um, this is how we, you know, this is this is some of the photo that how they practice and experience singing bowl. We actually put the singing bowl on the head, so the echo and the sound creators is very directly go into our head. And you know, we also put the singing bowl in different uh, direction in the body. And then on day two, we actually start to create um, a body drawing, which is um, adapt an adaptation from a body imaging workshop from Barbara Hammer, um, where they can actually experience how the, how the personal feelings um, can transform into drawing and abstract shape. I guide them through a very simple fit, a 10 to 15 minute meditations while they are lighting on the, on the big piece of paper. And then um, they are given a chance to present and after they draw and visualize what they can see during this meditation, they are giving, um, giving uh, some time to present what they are trying to visualize uh, in their body painting. This exercise actually successfully in a way helped the participant to find out who they are, what is their body feelings about. And the next step is actually to explore where the feelings come from and where uh, and how this queer haunting is created. This is some of the example of the, uh, of the, of the, of the body painting. Um, this, is the, this is the presentation, okay? Uh, some participants actually show us a tattoo on their body, which they also draw in the, in the body painting as well. Um, after that, uh, we invited uh, we invited actually different guests to uh, to share with the participant how different queer filmmakers produce their work. This include curator from film festival. At the same time, they also in, uh, they are also invited to repeatedly talk about their project, what they how they produce it. I want to emphasize this word repeatedly is because the repetition is the nature of practice. By repeatedly doing. Uh, uh, by repeatedly working on um, on different various projects, they're actually also uh, meditating their queer experience as well. So this is a picture of um, this uh, tutor of us to uh, tell us about the idea of sound uh, soundscape using the using storyboard, and we we also have uh, Ego talked about to share about uh, the experience in editing using uh, different programs, and we also have a queer um, uh, art director Cloud from Hong Kong to share his experience with us uh, working in professional film set. And this is um, when we are teaching the participant uh, various uh, filmmaking technique using you know semi-professional camera as well. <clears throat> so um, now I would like to share some of my um, video material from the class. Can you all still hear me? Great. So, um, so here is the materials. Um, on, sorry. So, okay. So this is one uh, video material. We actually have a participant interviewing a lot of um, people surrounding a skater park in Berlin, which is quite interesting. Oh, there's no sound, sorry. Is there no sound? Yeah. Uh, um, can you please reshare and uh, press the uh, include sound button? Okay, hold on. Um, here we go. Uh, uh, we share and include sound. 
No, it's not included, but um, let me actually, you know, let me actually just show you the picture and try to describe it because the, the, the sound is not as important. Um, all the need for the, for the technology things. Um, and then I'd like to share with you another video here. We actually spot in, um, in, a, in, a, in a, you know, a, a common space where there is queer people doing um, uh, skating as well. We was actually pretty amazed to see like like um, how the queer community of skater uh, immerse into into public as well. So after we we spoke this guy, we actually have a very good interview and chat with this um, with this um, people as well. <clears throat> so this is a fact video that I would like to share with you. This one. So we actually, um, he, he's actually um, <clears throat> a former drag performer from London, um, originally from, originally from, um, from Australia. He moved to, he moved to uh, the Berlin, actually uh, enjoying the queer community a lot. So this is one of, um, this is, this is like a behind the scene footage from the participant. So like you see how this queer skater uh, used the public space to become, you know, become his own uh, performing space as well. Here is the climax. This is how this is how how, how it catches up our our attentions. <laughs> Not this one. <laughs> there you go. So everybody was trying to, you know, take photos, and then we was very lucky to have like a very long um, interview. Um, uh, with him, and actually, this is a project from um, NADA. Let me show you. Go back to the to the Pepsi. Okay, here you go. So actually, um, this is more photos on um, what we were doing on editing as well. So this is actually a project from NADA. Uh, NADA is uh, identified themselves as a gender non-boundaries. She is Thai. Growing up in Switzerland, living in Hamburg during this time, um, she bring a project to us wanting to talk about the exclusivity, uh, exclusivity of a white queer skater community in Hamburg. But when she was researching and interviewing people in Berlin, she actually find out the situation in Berlin is very, very different from Hamburg. But since she cannot travel back and forth between Berlin and Hamburg, she has slightly adjusted her project point of views in our workshop. So Berlin they basically open up open up her uh their 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 open up their 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 mind as well um uh, compared to their experience in Hamburg. We also have another um Vietnamese German participant who also find uh find out a uh, Vietnamese poem written by their mother in social media. While this poem is not directly addressed to anyone, they actually uh, have a direct feelings and connection to this poem because the, po uh, the, the, the poem directly addressed a mother and daughter relationship. Uh, the safe space we created in our workshop become a space that they can revisit and talk about their feelings. But at one point, um, this participant feel she, that that poem would be too much for, for themselves. So um, um, they tell us that we um, they may have they, they may need more time to digest um, to work on the to, to to further work on the video. So this actually become the challenge and limitation of our uh, of our workshop because um, as so as these participants this 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 workshop is a very much participant oriented and queer experience oriented. And you can actually see from these two example we have so many diverse experience from different part of Germany. So um, this uh, and a lot of them actually is hope with their family of origin. So um, the challenges in this workshop is how do we tailor make a method 
and how do we find um, find a way to you know validate their feelings as well. Um, but then this diversified experience from each participant actually are very very eye opening for us, and it is actually very important for us to know their feelings and to validate and to tell them that the queer feeling is actually very very relevant to the queer community worldwide. Um, the introduction of the film production technique become the skills for to help them actually to polish their storytelling techniques and to sharpen and foreground their voice to enable and share the experience in the in a in a film and video platform, which is you know the very common platform like YouTube, Vimeo, and also in other film festival platform as well. Um, so I think I think. Um, the way to live an alternative queer world is actually practice uh, constantly to, uh, practice queer storytelling. So this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs> OK, thanks very much, Kit, for sharing not only on the um, filmmaking workshop, but also personal uh, personal view on queer hunting and um, very impressive. And by the way, later we're going to have uh, uh, one of our participants of the filmmaking workshop to share um the uh the experiments of the uh, um during the uh, eight days uh, for a weekend uh, but before that we're going to have uh, a review to introduce about uh, what's uh, what's what's what happened at the podcasting workshop yeah uh thank you Bobo. uh i was the coordinator of the podcasting workshop uh let me see if i can share my screen uh, again. Um, yeah, uh, the workshop uh, was designed to provide participants with the knowledge of uh, uh, practical skills and tools to produce their own podcast. Uh, the podcast was very much like one on one basic uh, podcast and it was challenging in so many ways for me. Um, as a non-podcaster, I am someone who likes and consumes a lot of uh, podcasts. And I thought, you know, to kind of like give an alternative to like a knowledge transfer and like knowledge making outside of uh, academia, because I'm also like in uh, graduate school right now, like constantly thinking about like how to make my work more accessible. And this idea of like making or, like uh, coordinating a podcasting workshop came from that like my own personal experience of like actually learning from a podcast episode that I you know used to listen going to university and like how much of that contributed to like my my work as an academic um, also like in graduate school constantly thinking constantly reading and also listening and also like watching theory um, and it was the podcasting workshop was led by six different facilitators from various backgrounds, interdisciplines uh, coming together to share their knowledge. Um, similar to the filmmaking workshop, there were there was no like hierarchy in that as well. The most challenging part of me was to like structure the content of the workshop. As a non-podcaster, you know, I had to ask so many questions to the facilitators. And I had to also like organize a meeting how we can sort of like create a format and content that would benefit the participants. Um, and it worked out well uh, at the end, although with all the challenges and like with me not knowing so much about like podcasting in terms of like um, production and also like what needs to be done behind the scene. That was like one thing that I was worried about. But thankfully, uh, Roger Grow, like this person, was such an angel uh, guiding me through like the process as well. So a lot of like my work and also like uh, the image in Queer Bandung is very much like collaborative curatorial practice, and my work specifically is also like center surrounding like um, this kind of topic of like community based and also like a cu uh, cur curatorial. Um, collaborative practice as well. Um, going back to the uh, podcasting workshop, the workshop cover uh, very basic stuff and skill like um, audio storytelling basics, including concept, format, uh, structure, the art of interview, and how to prepare 
and conduct various interview types, sound mixing, editing, distribution, and project sustainability. Um, these are some of the pictures from the podcasting workshop. It was done uh, in two consecutive, uh, consecutive uh, weekends so that we had a bit of time for the participant to produce uh, their own podcast. What was beautiful uh, about the whole workshop process was that it did not go exactly how I planned it. Um, but what was beautiful about that, a lot of like meaningful friendship and connection were from, formed uh, at the workshop uh, by like sharing and exchanging information uh, among participants themselves. So that was like exactly how the festival and vision, you know, like imagining Grimbanu itself to be like. Um, and I'm so happy that one of the participants and students, Henry, this person will be, uh, they are here actually, um, and they will talk about their podcast and also like their experience um, being part of the podcasting workshop. And yeah, I think that's the end of a uh, little bit of like um, the podcasting workshop and I will give the mic back to Popo. Okay, thanks very much, Ricky, for sharing to us. And I want to say, I want to say all those information are overwhelming and getting more and more interesting. So by the way, we all we have the time for Q&A. So our audience, please get ready for your question. And uh, uh, but before that, we are going to invite Ahmed from the filmmaking workshop to share about the experiments. Hi everybody, I'm uh, glad to be here with you and um, thank you for the invitation. Um, I was a participant in the filmmaking workshop and I want to share some of my reflection and experiences. I will go back a little bit to before the workshop and share a bit about my journey. Um, and I feel that uh, the point that Kit made about queer storytelling is my, my starting point. So um, I don't have access to the to um, moderate the, my slides, so I will need help from Hangui to... Sure, sure. <laughs> so I am sharing the slides now. Can anyone tell me whether the slide is showing your screen? Yes, it's, it's showing. showing. OK, brilliant. So you can start now. So when you want me to change the, to the next slide, just to say next slide. OK, I will. Thank you. OK, next. Um, just a little bit about my background. So I uh, come from Egypt and I come from a health background. Um, and I was working a lot in sexual health projects in Egypt. Um, and I, at some point, I felt that I want to transfer the knowledge that I was having and um, creating and transferring within the communities that I work with um, to the online sphere. So I started to blog and blogging in Egypt was a very important tool of resistance because we didn't have independent media until 2005. Um, and at, around that time, there was a lot of blogs trying to kind of highlight social issues and um, political issues that were not discussed in, in the media. So I try to bring stories around sexuality and gender to the online uh, sphere. Um, next. At the same time, um, there were also media um, that were trying to tell stories about queer life in Egypt, but these media were international media, as you can see on those slides. Um, there are um, stuff from Reuters, New York Times, especially after the revolution in Egypt in 2011, there was a lot of interest to cover those kind of stories. Um, at the same time, we felt as a queer community in Egypt that there is a lot of problems with this reporting. There was a lot of issues involved. Sometimes the journalists um, didn't follow media ethics. Sometimes they outed people, mentioned names that they were not supposed to be mentioned, mentioned uh, places of the queer community that are supposed to remain secret. Um, at the same time, we felt that we needed sometimes to collaborate with them, to work with them, so that the story that is being told 
um, still reflects our reality. So that was a big um, challenge for the community, uh, how to deal with this um, storytelling. And that's why the title of this slide is, is um, if modern journalism somehow can be equated to anthropology in the sense that it's um, a science that um, tries to kind of um, research the natives of the third world um, and produce knowledge that doesn't necessarily um, improve the lives of those people, but um, um, kind of um, in exploits those stories um, to um, prove certain points about who is the Western world and who is the other world. Next slide, please. So, um, in that sense, also, I just want to say on the point of visibility, especially um, that I come from a place like Egypt, that visibility has been a double-edged sword. In this slide, you can see how um, media um, fetishizes um, queer stories, but also sometimes exploits the queer stories um, to um, create success and fame. In this case, for example, in Egypt in 2014, um, a media uh, person um, caused a raid in a, on a bathhouse in Egypt. Um, so there was a lot of the dynamic where media people in Egypt um, exploit um, queer stories just to create a media, uh, a kind of like a moral panic. Um, at the expense of the safety of queer uh, people. Next slide. Um, so yeah, um, I think what is also important for me is to talk, since we are talking about uh, queer bandong and this kind of like third world perspectives, um, this event was very important for me and um, it has inspired so many people around the world. Um, now nobody really knows what is going on in Egypt and what what um, happened after that. But I think what is also important is that um, this kind of big events are also um, covered in Western media in a certain way, which also um, obliter obliterates other narratives of the people going um, through this kind of event. So um, if we have if we in Egypt say that the revolution has failed, for us, it is clear that it's about the counter revolution and the local politicians that failed the revolution, but it's also also about how Europe and the US and the Western powers also collaborated with the dictators that um, crushed the revolution. Next slide, please. So moving on from Egypt to Germany. And I in 2014, I had to escape Egypt because of my political uh, engagement and um, moved to Germany and I was really shocked to see how those kind of dynamics with media and storytelling were also repeating themselves. So um, the refugee uh, crisis of 2015, maybe you still remember, uh, the, the, the description itself as a crisis and how it was reported that um, Germany has um, accepted and welcomed so many people that, uh, of course, is an important narrative because other uh, countries in Europe were not accepting refugees as much as, in, uh, as Germany. At the same time, this uh, narrative um, um, kind of also uh, dilutes the, the crisis of the, that the refugees themselves were going through and that this crisis actually is a crisis of the border system that Europe creates um, to uh, not allow people to um, come to Europe. So I will just share a little story when I was um, doing a German class in, in, in Germany, in Berlin, when I arrived here. And I remember in, a, in that class, there was um, a man who was sitting there and I didn't know he, what he was doing. And then I realized that this man is a journalist who is basically cover, writing a story about the integration of refugees. And um, nobody asked us if this person was um, should be there or not. And then and this person then came to try to um, interview me. Um, and especially when he found out that I was living with a person, um, a German person with a Jewish background, 
um, they really wanted to just come to my place and shoot the story. So I'm just sharing the story as um, kind of like an example of um, those kind of dynamics of storytelling and media um, that kind of don't really respect the the ethics of um, of what what stories are actually are told. Next, please. And this is also uh, other examples of how the German media was um, talking about refugees. You can all uh, even see from the images how um, those kind of like shadows and those kind of hidden people um, are talked about, but they don't get this chance to kind of speak and tell their stories um, themselves. So next, please. And I'm sharing these two um, here, um, kind of a meme, because I think also <laughs> sometimes we need the meme with some um, kind of comic relief. Um, to also kind of like make the point about um, who gets to share their stories and um, what happens when people share their stories about with through other media. Um, and then their narratives get twisted in the process. And I also have a story about this um, slide um, since I remember actually not very long ago, there was an academic conference organized uh, on refugee, on queer refugees. And all the speakers, all the panelists in the conference were, um, didn't have refugee background and the only rec um, refugee person that was invited was um, invited there to um, make a dance performance, which I also, I mean, I respect that a dance performance can be a sort of self-expression. Um, but however, it just repeats the dynamic of queer refugees not being able to speak for themselves. So yeah, this brings me to the point of um, being, being a participant in the workshop. Um, so I, I, I made the application and I was so um, uh, glad and lucky to be accepted in this space because I, all this kind of context that I was sharing um, brings me to the point of like how queer refugee stories are told. The, the problem with or like the patterns that I see in how queer refugee stories are told is that they um, um, enforce this binary between um, our countries, the region we come from, as backward, homophobic, and um, violent, and the Western world as um, progressive, liberal, and enlightened, and that um, that kind of narrative, as um, Sartre in the beginning and other people were talking about how queer of color experiences, especially in places like Berlin, um, are kind of like minimized, um, and um, we don't have also um, access to um, institutions that support our kind of our art and creativity. So for me, being in a space like um, the workshop was a chance for me to kind of tell my story, to practice and learn how to actually um, ha create new tools to tell my story, but also to connect with other queers of color from other places in the world where these connections were not possible before. Um, so I think this is really the power of, of being in a space like this and um, being able to tell the story um, of a queer refugee. The film project that I was working on during the workshop and I'm still working on is called Queer Exile. And just to finish my talk, I, I can invite you to just watch a few um, seconds of the, of the piece. think about return.
Hallo. Ähm, ich mach nur ein Foto von die Okay, so is that the end of the slide? Thank you for um, your technical assistance. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> I'm terrible. <laughs> oh no, Hongwen, you're wonderful, you're wonderful. You know, you're expert of team, so we are so, so lucky to have you here. And thanks, Ahmed, for sharing. Uh, and this topic is very important uh, on que uh, queer Excel when you are uh, you face such a big uh, challenge, political challenge in Egypt and then also exotized uh, by media in Europe. And uh, this 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 is something that we sh share a lot among different communities in in Germany, in Berlin. Um, and uh, next, we're going to invite Henry uh, to talk about their experiments in, uh, their, in the podcasting workshop, and which is also, uh, and Henry's podcast also addresses a very important uh, marginalized uh, community. And um, so please. Hi, yeah, so as Popo said, my name is Henry. Uh, I use they, them pronouns. I've been a cultural organizer in one way or another for close to a decade in both Vancouver and London. I currently live in Berlin. About a month ago, I officially launched my podcast called In Our Bodies. It is currently a podcast where I speak to other people of color who identify as disabled, having chronic illness, or who are neurodivergent. But really labels aside for me, if you ever have felt like not up to snuff in your body or in your mind, I'm trying to build a podcast where it's a space that celebrates that. Um, I truly would not have been able to make this podcast without the support and resources provided by the workshop. Before I get into my experiences with the podcast workshop, I want to speak a little bit about myself and how I decided to make a podcast in the first place. I'm queer and I'm ethnically Chinese. I've been chronically ill and struggling with my mental health for a long time and really have been doing this without any tangible vocabulary or support for what I was going through. Um, this is especially true uh, with my chronic illness. It is, as it is the story for many, I've had a lot of traumatic things and gaslighting happening to me um, from the medical complex, but also from friends and family because I've been sick most of my life. It really wasn't until I was hitting my mid twenties before I learned anything about disability advocacy, support, culture from the dis disabled community. It really changed how I saw myself for the better and really how I saw people in general. I even ended up writing my master's thesis at Goldsmiths in London on the connections between capitalism and disability. I was exposed to the disabled community by my white peers while I was studying in London. And while I will always be grateful to those friends, I quickly realized that there was a gap between the experiences I was seeing my white disabled peers have versus what I was going through in my life as someone who is digesting the realities of disability as a person of color. In short, the disability community is still very white. And that's a problem because with the acknowledgement, without the acknowledgement of disability for people of color, especially for black and indigenous folk, a lot of POCs who are disabled don't get the accommodation that they need, or when they get diagnosed, they get treated in a way that often ends up getting them abused or locked up in prison. Not ideal. Uh, it really feels weird seemingly having gained a new way of finding empathy for myself, but also feeling really lonely in it at the same time. I felt a tangible way for me to selfishly cultivate some community for myself, but also hopefully help other people of color who find themselves in the same spot was to make a podcast 
where me and other people of color could talk about disability or just talk about anything around the relationships that we have with our body and our mind navigating this world at large. This is a true story. The very day I decided to make a podcast, I opened up Facebook and one of the first posts I saw was a call out to sign up for this workshop. And I applied and thank God I got in. Very awesome. So the workshop. It was firstly such a breath of fresh air to be able to do this in person. As somewhat of an introvert, I definitely forgot how necessary it was to have social spaces like this during the lockdown. Moreover, when preparing for this presentation, I also realized how vital it was to share resources and get a talk about cool skills like podcast making amongst other people of color and other queers. I feel like all my life I've almost only had white people as educators and figures of knowledge of authority, mostly feeling the manufactured scarcity and or competition amongst my queer and POC peers to snag the limited spots in art circles, academic spaces, job interviews, you name it. I'm sure we can all relate. It really feels amazing to be able to do some thoughtful knowledge sharing in this space and not to feel alienated or in competition with, un with one another under the straight white gaze for once. It took me reflecting upon this workshop to really understand how rare this was. So seriously, thanks and hats off to Regil and the rest of the team for the thought that they put into what we ended up learning in these two weekends. We touched on, as Regil said before, we touched on basics, basic podcast structures, interview techniques, sourcing material, but they were very, very detailed. And we even learned stuff about being mindful about like legalities of learning, of legalities of like using music or using the photos or materials from guests. They really thought about everything. Really so much more than that was shared in the mere two weekends. I'm just right now gonna talk about what was memorable and helpful for me, not just from the people who were running the workshops, but from those who were attending as well. Um, one of the most memorable kind of funny and helpful things that were taught to us in the first weekend by one of the facilitators, Abby Bahiranthan, was these vocal exercises that they shared. These were warm ups to make sure that we spoke clearly and articulated our words popular properly during the podcast. I still bite down on a cork or a big felt pen to practice my intros or right before an interview. And I really do think that I sound better for it. Um, there's a lot that I didn't know. I don't have very much experience or really any experience at all in the podcast world. I'm really grateful that we got to do a basic rundown of audio editing. I later also got extra help from one of the other participants, Ashley, for editing the music in my podcast. I know that a lot of people say that, oh, there's so many resources online, everybody can learn anything just by themselves, but not everybody finds it really that easy to be learning stuff online without the assistance of other people or other community members there to kind of like assist or ask questions. I'm definitely one of those people. And I feel like if I were to have tried to make this podcast without the audio training alone from the workshop, I might have found it too overwhelming to even start. I really like that beyond the technical skills and basics to podcast building taught, they also brought in, um, Regil mentioned them before, uh, Rodrigo Sorzanelli. For Rodrigo's part of the workshop, we did writing exercise that help us hone the skill in pushing our creative imagination, focusing on what was really what it really was that we were trying to make in our artistic practice, but obviously specifically for this podcast project. Having a space to do that amongst our peers and hearing how everybody writes, thinks, creates is again something that is probably not even just rare for me. I don't think that I've ever been able to do that with other people, let alone other queer people of color. And at this point, it brings me to wanting to talk about how amazing it was being around the other participants in the workshop as well. It was really very fulfilling and very helpful. I really learned a lot from how other people decided to format their podcasts, what segments that they decided to include and create. My podcast is currently just people chatting, but it is definitely because of watching how other people were putting together their podcasts over the two weekends 
that it's helping me start to already think about how I can continue to build what it is that I'm trying to make for my podcast. There was also just a lot of knowing and trust that I felt from those running the podcast and the participants. I felt really held and able to share my ideas and I got a lot of feedback as we were doing the work. Lastly, I wanted to talk about Dorhi Lamo's part of the workshop where they talked about the possibilities of possibilities to market and monetize for our podcast. I thought this was really important because I currently don't expect to be making any money off this project. And yes, fuck our generation for having to monetize all of our hobbies, but it's nevertheless still really good knowledge to have. A lot of us don't even know where to begin to find people to support our work. Dorhee's part of the workshop really pulled the curtain back a bit on the mechanics of how sponsorship and funding could work in this podcast world. Making money or having financial support can be can really make or break for the longevity, like can make or break the longevity of a project, right? So yeah, those were the bits that I found really amazing in the project, in the podcast workshop. Um, and this was my experience. I think the main takeaway I would want to reiterate is that it's really just vital to continue to create spaces where we as queer humans and as people of color get to share knowledge and support each other in the things we make and help each other fill in the gaps. I really did not know how much I was missing that in my life until I got to experience it. Um, I want to end with a little clip uh, from my podcast. This is the most recent episode. This is me talking to musician, pole dancer extraordinaire. Their name is George Lubon. This is, um, and we're talking about disability and queerness uh, in this little clip. So Hong Kong way, if you could play the clip, that would be amazing. But because uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask is if you feel like there's any link between disability and queerness as well, you know, so I have been thinking about this and I think yes in the way that both disability and queerness force you to think very consciously about self mm -hmm. in a way that non-queer and non-disabled people don't have to mm -hmm. um so like just thinking about your gender uh means a lot of things it means like picking apart what body means versus what identity means versus what mood means. Mm. Um, and I think those same skills you use with a lot of, at least with my disabilities, this sort of whole body versus identity versus mood is so smushed. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's not a word um but <laughs> it is now <laughs> yes it is so i think they like i think a lot of people who are queer are also disabled but perhaps because of the way disability forces you to think you're more likely to realize you're queer or yeah. accept that you're queer and also yeah. vice versa because not all disabled people seek diagnoses or ever accept that they are disabled or identify mm -hmm. with that word mm -hmm. um and Sometimes when you're already other, it's easier to see the other other. The other other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the clip. <laughs> Okay, thanks very much, Henry. And one thing I want to ask Hong is this possible to uh, allow everybody uh, through messaging to the chatting box? Because now I see it doesn't function if you're not a manager. Um, because uh, soon we are about to open the question uh, Q&A time and I don't know if people, everybody is comfortable to turn on the camera, but of course, if you have a question, I really encourage you to turn on your camera and speak in the, uh, in, uh, to us and to, about your question. Uh, but uh, also uh, maybe we find we figured out a way to share Henry's for example for example Henry's uh, podcast if there is a link and we can uh, to put into the chatting box or uh, we figured out a way.
way to share to uh, to the participant today. Uh, but before that, I also have some. Um, uh, uh, I would love to have a few minutes to share my thoughts and uh, my thoughts, and also uh, maybe everybody can give there a little bit more of, about further information, updated information, and the conclusion. And uh, um, after after listening to the uh, uh, to the pres uh, presentation of all of you, I feel now, especially after. Uh, pandemic is so important to have this physical space, no matter um, space to watch films or doing a uh, do workshop and get to know each other together, uh, which I can emph uh, emphasize, uh, have a lot of emphasis that uh, uh, the reason why I go to uh, film school um, was making making documentary was because I was so I was so introvert when I was in university. I was very shy with a student uh, in film school sitting in the back uh, back row and even too uh, uh, too sh nervous to raise any 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 questions but after I got this camera this really gave me uh, opportunity I said camera is my is my uh, teacher and also also my doctor actually healed a lot of a uh, lot of issues I had to deal with with me about my identity and second second thing I feel being together with uh, uh, because I was lucky enough to uh, to have the uh, been to most of the days of the two workshop um, for um, uh, for the filmmaking workshop, I also uh, uh, give um, one of the uh, give one lecture and also went to listen to many of the other um, uh, lectures. And during the podcasting workshop, I also went there to 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 take photos. And then one thing, uh, beside the, the professional side, and I remember every time we have a lunch break, we enjoy so much eating together and uh, delicious food and mostly uh, ordering from from non-white uh, service and uh, uh, enjoying Asian food or uh, other uh, cuisines and uh, also chatting with with each other it was so precious and it brought definitely um, very very important for us to sitting together um, and uh, and um, talking about profession or non-professional or gossip and uh, it was a lot of fun um, and just secondly I want to share uh, that after after our workshop in uh, in Berlin and screenings in Berlin uh, we're also lucky enough is the help of the uh, uh, um, of other festival and also our co-curator, um, we we got to uh, we were lucky enough to travel to Munich and Hamburg and to share our uh, our uh, imagining crib and doom program and uh, guest curating um, program with them and uh, also hosting and participating panel. Uh, I I found it was also a very uh, fascinating um, process and um, we got I realized even though the uh, um, it's still long progress to really have those festival diversified, but uh, uh, at least from this two trip, I feel very touched that we have these allies and uh, they have awareness that the society of Germany need to be improved and need to be um, more different voice need to be seen, need more uh, diverse uh, of film need to need to be watched. Um, so therefore, I'm also I would uh, also invite maybe any of you have uh, have stuff to share uh, on this topic about uh, what could happen uh, to the future or what is happening now or if you have any updates. Regio, maybe you can share your experiments with uh, uh, Hamburg Queer Film Festival and how was it, how was our tour in Hamburg? Uh, uh, how does that mean to you? Yeah. Um... Like before I talk about that, I just also wanted to say like a few things about the Imagining Queer Bandung in general after like hearing Henry talk about their project and finally like release, you know, that project into the wild because we never had that conversation after the workshop ended because like we were running around doing like other, you know, festival. So it's it's really, I don't know, finally like we are harvesting, you know, what we planted. And it feels good to hear something amazing come uh, came out of like the podcasting workshop. Um, I think like Henry's project is one of the few that is already out right now, and I'm so happy and I'm so like all for the one right now to hear this incredible work um, born out of our festival. Uh, the Hamburg 
queer film festival was also like incredible like magnificent in so many ways just kind of like because i moved to hamburg uh, three years ago and that's how like all this thing and uh started up and uh it was good to be back in this place where it all started um and hamburg is very much like um middle class white society so it is kind of like challenging to create this kind of space and to kind of like be you know feasible in this kind of way so to be able to like show and like bring our festival to this kind of uh, city really gave me the affirmation of like wanting to create something um more and producing something to like create you know space for people like me who often feel like invisible in the art and also like in academia we actually had to fight for our space to be there as well so that was like really good to kind of like um be in that space and like be the center you know like be the main character if you want if you will um so also i want to thank you know sarn bivak and popo as well um for co-organizing everything together and gave me the language open up so many doors specifically for asia london danny and jenny for letting me be part of the platform it has been an incredible incredible journey to be able to curate this kind of stuff uh, alongside people that I admire, people that I love, people from the community, and it has been like empowering in so many ways. I wouldn't be where I am today with this, without this, you know, collective effort, collective work, collective uh, project. Um, maybe, you know, that sounds strange to some people, but like that's really vital in my practice as well. And how this kind of like people influence the way how I think this kind of like festival and like people that I engage with um, in the workshop, like Ahmed, like Henry and everyone else also like gave me, new, you know, like new perspective in life and like how I, you know, shape myself as an individual and like what does like my work mean uh, for the community in, in, in general. Uh, so this has been like an incredible journey of like one year. Uh, of curating um, and making this incredible collaboration happen. And uh, we wouldn't be able to do all of this without everyone who is on this panel right now. So I just want to thank San Popo, Henry, Ahmed, also Hong Wei for organizing this. Also, a kid for leading the filmmaking workshop as well. Um, and that is like what we meant by like envisioning and also like reimagining what, imagining we're wondering what that a conference, you know, like was about, but like in the in the in the queer context and like how we can use that spirit to reimagine a world where like queer, brown and black bodies can come together and collectively think about our identities and ourselves, not always like about our struggle, but also like our power in the society, specifically in a place where it is majority uh, predominantly white uh, society. Uh, navigating ourselves uh, as cultural uh, practitioners. So I mean, I want I w thanks also for for this. And I want to add that I have been having a short conversation with Kit also about the importance of creating infrastructure. Um, like basically, I have feel the feeling that a lot of projects, like amazing project, is usually sort of you know like like a one punch. Or like one orgasm that that you come and then but like it doesn't repeat and actually i've been thinking a lot about how should we collect our effort to create a proper infrastructure that means money that means space where queer of colors actually can have like ongoing things you know so it can go from easy logistic like if you want a studio there should be a studio that you can rent for free or little money and we should let's say try to move forward this way so our projects or initiative would not be just like one time per year, but like something that stays for longer term. But that would be the future goal of, you know, if any one of you are interested, let's just talk and brainstorm about it. Yeah. Okay, so now this uh, chatting box still doesn't function. I guess if anyone has a question, you will have to raise your hand and then we will uh, just or just turn on your camera and microphone to speak now. Do we already have any question? Uh, no, I can't see any questions in the chatting box. I apologize. I've tried to add everyone to the kind of host, but I can't do it technologically. So I'm pretty hope hopeless. So while people are thinking about their questions, please 
do raise your hand or please do just uh, turn on your camera and mic and ask questions. So can I ask a few questions or oh, oh, one question <laughs> at least? So, yeah. so the question is that, uh, so obviously we are from different cultural backgrounds and, and so on. So the world that we're living in actually is not a peaceful world. So where there are there are a lot of what regional and political and economic conflicts between countries and regions. So even in Asia, I mean, there are different conflicts and uh, clashes. So how does this international what relation or geopolitics affect or may not affect your collaboration? In your collaboration, have you encountered any difficulties, cultural differences, and how do you resolve them? Um, maybe let me answer first. I think the, especially what I experienced after moving back to Hong Kong is like the quarantine regulations uh, is definitely limiting people from traveling. Uh, one can actually, uh, I can actually go out like, you know, uh, to teach another workshop again, but I'll have to count uh, when I return to Hong Kong um, a 21 day quarantine in a destination hotel that I have to pay for myself. So this is this this make actually like the whole COVID policy that is different from different country is limiting me from <clears throat> you know um, teaching or sharing experience. Especially the whole workshop is um, it's very much about experiencing and it's a lot about you know get really getting together. So. Um, yeah, this is this is the main problem I am facing right now. Um, if if I'm living in a country that has a very tight um, COVID policy, I think I think for me it's interesting. That right before I I can I joined this event, I was interviewed two Indian artists. We had a conversation and. Uh, also talking about uh, solidarity become different regions, especially we are, we are sort of neighbors in Asia, but uh, uh, somehow uh, I, I, I literally heard white people were telling me. So once I was saying I was saying goodbye to a, to a friend and I said, I'm going to meet a, a Filipino artist friend of mine later. And then that person was said, oh, wow, he was he was halfly joking. And I said, I never heard Chinese people has uh, Filipino friends. And uh, I, aren't you guys enemies? And uh, even if it's jokers, are also almost traumatized. And so what? Um, at that time, there was some conflict between the two government on some island in Pacific Pacific Ocean. But uh, it was I, I was but it also also fascinating how this society uh, portrayed about uh, how they assume you because you you two, you two government have a conflict with each other and then how you can't make a friend with with each other and then also talk, we also talk about all oh, the border conflict between China and India and how come they would uh, uh, project this to us uh, two people living in Germany, one from China, one from India. But this, this is how I feel. This is so beautiful that we meet here in uh, in Berlin, and uh, we get to know each other, become friends, and become become collaborator. And no matter how much I say, uh, how much uh, every time people tell me, oh, Berlin is so diverse, diverse, and uh, also uh, so uh, so much uh, so tolerant, so uh, acceptable for. Uh, but sometimes I just roll my eyes. But I have to say, uh, this this city at least gave us the opportunity, and also even with uh, government funding, and public funding, to create those those uh, workshop and create those space. Uh, no matter it's just, uh, it's a short uh, organism or it's a long term uh, uh, relationship, and uh, it, it was it was to, for me, and uh, I appreciate those those kind of, those opportunity. Uh, um. Yeah, navigating conflicts in this kind of context, um, not necessarily like a conflict. I think uh, during our one of the screening, we had a program for transgender uh, topics at the film uh, festival. And I happened to be the curator of that program. As a non-trans person, it was it's really difficult for me to sort of like speak on their, you know, behalf of them. So like I did not want to do and reproduce that kind of like a discourse. 
Um, so I was kind of baffled to kind of like see like what I can do, like how we can create this space and like make this space available for the people who actually have the lived experience as like trans body as well. Um, again, it's coming back to like friendship and also like our community work and being able to be close proximate with people who identify as like trans um, bodies around that. So we invited those people to talk about their personal experience as filmmakers. We had uh, Zoya from the Trans uh, Film Festival Berlin. And also we were in conversation with uh, Blue Elliot, who is also like a non-binary trans black filmmaker from Berlin as well, talking about their experience running a festivals, also like being filmmakers, talking about their own work in that context as well. Um, so like, yeah, I must admit that like being like curating that program as a non uh, trans person was in so many ways difficult for me because again, you know, like that's what you hear often is like people um, talking on behalf of you about like their, you know, like your identity because that was also like my experience in Indonesia uh, working with so many like what academics from like Ivy Leagues, for example, talking about like stuff um, decolonizing uh, uh, knowledge production and also like queer topics in Indonesian context as well. So like coming from the understanding, we understood like how we did not want to produce any of those uh, pattern as well. Um, and we were happy like, you know, as much Berlin is also like not exactly, it's not like the, the place that it sells. It's not like us, it's not the safe space that a lot of people talk about in so many ways, but also I think it provides um, this kind of like opportunity and for some people it is special in their own ways like it's it depends on like how you interpret your personal experience but I wouldn't sell it as like this uh, queer maker if you want to call it that but again you know I think they're compared to like well like places like Hamburg it's just, I think we are afforded with that kind of opportunity being like close to like a physical proximate with people um, and explore this kind of like topics together and also like the power of like listening as well. And I think that was also like important for me in the in the podcasting workshop to also like let the people facilitator decide for themselves instead of me like telling them what to do and concepts was everything all together. Oh wait, do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, well, now that I can see from the chat, so uh, please, audience, please ask questions. So I'll finish up with the last question. So if we don't see any more questions or don't see any people raising their hand or turning on their mic, then I'll ask my last final question. But before that, I I, I was sorry to maybe you can uh, I don't know if anyone in Berlin, <laughs> oh, of course, we are both ba mostly based in Berlin, but CERN had uh, uh, this uh, untitled uh, film festival and happening, and maybe can do a little bit of uh, advertisement about it. And especially there is also, I see this Friday, there's, there's going to be a free screenings of a, a workshop result from the, their their workshop, and it, it could be someone uh, very interesting for some of the participants or if you can introduce about it. Yeah, I mean, I, I will make it very short. Um, basically, it's a new program which focus on Southeast Asian mainland, so Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. And we show film from that region, but also from people in diaspora. So actually, a lot of them also born in Germany. So we show also film from them too. And if, if this Friday, we're going to show another workshop that I did be making workshop last year. So it was during the lockdown, literally with these communities, um, sort of people of colors community. It was sort of like not queer centric per se, but we have a lot of queer participants also, but it was started yeah, basically on a similar workshop to this one with the queer bandung that we did. And basically it is the first time that we will see the results, like kind of finished the film from the workshop of last year. And I'm very excited to see um, if any of you are in Berlin, just, I don't know, come to Cinema Transtopia on Friday to see something amazing. But yeah. Yeah, and there are uh, more screenings um, from from this Thursday opening, November 11th until December 4th. And so uh, you should come because the program is great if you're in Berlin or if you have friends in Berlin, 
remember to to uh, to send them to tell them just search on title or uh, cinema trans topia back and then you will see the uh, we will find the link to the festival. And Hongwei, what is your last question? Oh, uh, so no, uh, last about two questions. Uh, so uh, another advertisement, which is I know that Beijing Queer Film Festival is going on at the moment, and you are one of the festival directors. So could you talk about the 20th anniversary of the festival? So what's happening this year? What's new? What's exciting? Okay, this year is really important because it's our 20 years anniversary. And uh, but obviously, I will not uh, uh, st starting with the first year. <laughs> so, but uh, it was founded in 2001. So it was a miracle. Every day, every every edition of the festival, we think it was a miracle that we still exist. <laughs> and uh, another every day is a miracle. But this year we have some special section, uh, including memory of some filmmakers who had uh, passed away. Um, and we have a rich retrospective of the Barbara Hammer and also Taiwanese filmmaker Mickey Chang. Uh, and both of them were, uh, had uh, come to our festival in Beijing before. Uh, and uh, uh, we are also screening two films by uh, Kit Hong and Stoma and uh, uh, Forever 17. Both of them are uh, had, had some uh, memory to share with uh, people who passed away and so there was just a bit special and we also had some retros retrospective on uh, of the uh, uh, classic uh, queer films we, we screened Paris is Burning and also uh, Saving Face which is classic Chinese uh, uh, American lesbian uh, family drama um, and uh, I'm uh, uh, and we in cooperated with the uh, Goethe Institute. We are presenting two German films. One is Neuer Bau, uh, talking about the trans men story, and the other one is Generation um, by uh, lesbian and queer filmmaker uh, pioneer um, Monica Choi. And uh, so this I would really love to uh, encourage you to to go and watch and uh, buy uh, way more our. Our opening film is uh, uh, Rizzi, The Days by uh, Taiwanese, uh, iconic Taiwanese Malaysia filmmaker Tsai Ming Liang. So really proud to uh, to include them. Uh, right now, uh, the situation in, in uh, Beijing is still not that uh, uh, not that clear. Can we have uh, the festival until the end? Uh, uh, this. Uh, despite the political environment and also COVID situation, but we hope they uh, all the screening will go well. And uh, on this uh, um, Sunday, I'm remotely moderating a panel about uh, diaspora in uh, creation and uh, uh, creativity uh, in diaspora, talking about the overseas uh, uh, Chinese uh, film, uh, queer filmmaking. And Kate will also be there as one of our panelists. Uh, unfortunately, it's not live streaming, but uh, uh, if you have Beijing, uh, friends in Beijing, tell them to uh, to look uh, look up the um, event on the website of the Goethe Institute. Um, so that's it. Mm -hmm. Great, uh, that sounds exciting. So do we have more questions or do we, uh, do participants, uh, do panelists have questions for each other? So I see no questions. Then my last question is, what is your well, future plan? What is your future personal development or career plan? Uh, or uh, uh, how are you going to take from here, from the Queer Bandung event? So if you have started making a podcast or making a film, and do you have any plans to continue to screen it and so on? So can I start from Harry? Um, I'm just trying to think. I yeah, I have plans just to like continue making these episodes, but I also am trying to brainstorm as to how to continue to develop the formatting of this. Like I and and to just I don't know create interesting content that is beyond just like long form conversations. Um, yeah, those those are my future plans. Plans with the podcast, just continuing to develop and see what is the most interesting way to be like delivering information and conversations and like profiles of people of color who are disabled, neurodivergent, and chronically ill. Brilliant. Can you remind us of your podcast channel or your podcast? Yeah, so uh, you can find it on Instagram and you'll find the links on there. It's called In Our Bodies. 
So I N O U R B O D I E S. Actually, something I was suggesting is maybe would it be useful if we all kind of like had like sent an email list of like all of the things that like all of the events that we talked about yes. like yes. later on it might be it might be useful to send that out to the like to the guests because yeah I, I there's some things I want to check out as well but I I didn't catch all of the names yeah brilliant brilliant I'm going to send you an email and collect all the information and all yeah. and all, uh, all I'm going to share all, all this information with the registered participants so thank yeah that would be amazing mm -hmm. thanks thank you Ahmed, can I invite you to say next? Yeah, um, I mean, my my plan is to create more stories, to tell, more, to do more queer storytelling um, in different forms. Um, I mean, I'm um, I'm a writer, so that's usually the form that I work with. And uh, and and thanks to the workshop, I learned a new language to for que queer storytelling. Um, it's it's an exciting uh, process always to learn a new language, um, and it's, it makes you kind of like um, think in new ways. Um, so in this kind of like post production phase of creating a film, um, I'm still like doing a lot of reflection. Um, what is my language? What is the way that I express myself? Um, but also what kind of like uh, collaborations that can come out of this and especially when we work with um, video or film um, it's a very it's very different from writing because uh, writing can be a very solitary kind of activity um, but with filmmaking um, you need to work with other people and um, then in that process then there is like this very exciting kind of um, sharing creativity and um, learning from other people. So, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to to um, work further in this project and all this kind of collaborative creativity process that will come out of it um, for now. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, you, uh, yeah, your film clip is, uh, looks fantastic. So looking forward to seeing your film when it's ready. Thank you. Thank you. Can I invite Sant to talk next? Um, yeah, so basically um, I'm following my kind of film career also. Um, I'm finishing a short film um, based on collective voices and music making. So basically queer musicians. So that's a documentary that I'm finishing that will be around hopefully the world, if not soon. Um, and yeah, there's this um, Southeast Asian film program that I curate, as I said. And we will see also how we expand on things. Um, currently, I research a lot about archive materials on migration and Cold War period. So let's see what comes out of that. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Sant. And Kate Hong? Um, I think I have two areas that I'm interested um, in researching the content. Uh, I'm very interested in um, the relationship of, uh, between queer and direct blood, blood kin, like the kinship, queer kinship. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of the film was talking about you know the exclusive community of queer people, and then um, they, there is not much um, films about you know our parents or how our parents or how our family feel about us. So I would like to actually look at this area of how how queer people is actually being perceived by their direct uh, you know, inter intimate encounter. And then another area is like I'm very interested in looking at the diaspora of Hong Kong people. As you may know, there's a lot of Hong Kong people leaving home. And then I also want to see how the queer people, the queer diaspora around the world, uh, which is originally from Hong Kong. I think uh, technologically why I think I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in exploring the possibility of uh, virtual reality, like 360 degree video and how that kind of um, technology can recreate different type of cinematic experience to us. Mm -hmm. Brilliant, great. So, uh, Aragino. Uh, yeah. Well, Queer Asia is holding our uh, debut event in Hamburg um, because, you know, we feel like 
everything happens in uh, in Berlin. So like this is our vision to like decentralize the platform, and we are holding um, our first debut called Rice Squares um, Performance Night on the twenty seventh of November. So that is happening. I'm so excited to be collaborating with so many incredible people. Uh, this is like a Hamburg Berlin exchange program where we invite artists, performances, performers from Berlin to perform in Hamburg and also like to amplify the voices and the work of uh, people of color queer in Hamburg as well. So that is like my upcoming project. Uh, and my personal project is to finish my master thesis. <laughs> I think it's about time. <laughs> slowly going back to academia and uh, I will focus on my thesis on queer migration and the arts and like how migration inform like this is like kind of like my memoir but like not really how people like myself from the global south um, born in the global south migrated to like places like Germany and like how you use kind of like the global north language like I wasn't a person of color until I I came here like three years ago. So like how that kind of migration informed my sexuality, how this kind of like journey informed our art as well and like exploring all these languages that we didn't have like growing up. Um, so that is like my uh, project for my academic work. And um, also like I'm doing uh, cinema queer in the mountains with the Erasmus Plus program with a critical queer solidarity in Berlin. Also Sun is one of the workshop facilitator. So that is happening in January in Austria, in the Austrian op. So we will have like four different queer organizations from Europe coming together to learn about basic filmmaking. Um, and it is led by uh, BIPOC queer filmmakers such as Sarn, Elliot Blue, who was also like part of the film festival guest speaker. So yeah, so those are the three things that I'm working on right now. Sounds great. So thank you very much. Pua Pua, the final word is yours. Okay, so I don't have many uh, events in com the coming weeks because I need to co concentrate on film projects. I recently working on two short films and also developing my uh, feature debut. Uh, but if any events going on, I'm, I usually put on my uh, website. It's very easy to remember. It is popofan.net. Uh, so there are also my contacts on it. And you can also try to find me on social media. I'm a social media whore. I'm on Instagram, uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, and also TikTok. Talk, <laughs> and uh, I'm looking forward to hear uh, back uh, hear from any of you uh, if you have any uh, interesting on um, collaborating uh, or uh, feedback to me. And right. thanks, Hong, so much for uh, and uh, North Hain University and the festival uh, to host us. Yeah, oh, well, that's going to be my uh, acknowledgement as well. So thank the Festival of Social Sciences at University Nottingham for supporting this event and thank the event teams. And uh, again, we, today's recording will be shared among participants by email. So uh, along with the kind of email with the video link, I'm also going to share some resources that will be shared amongst our panelists. So thank all the panelists for sharing your experience, knowledge and dreams. What a wonderful panel. Thanks so much. OK, bye. Have a good day. Bye. Have a nice day.